Vermeer capitalized on map making as a subject in his paintings. Uh, he wasn't the only one to use maps. They appear in many uh, Dutch uh, pictures, but no one, no one does them as detailed and as specifically as Vermeer. Well, let's start with <clears throat> one of his earliest paintings, The Officer and the Laughing Girl, an early work. And there you see on the back wall this uh, large map that looks rather small because it seems to be closer to the woman in front of it. You could identify this map by just looking at his painting because there's a Latin inscription that close up you can read and it says new and accurate map of Holland and West Friesland. <clears throat> but many people today might not recognize Holland and West Friesland. North is not at the top. North is to the right. North um, at the top is after all only a convention. Um, they put these maps in more of an artistic way, in a way, or how it made sense to put the land formation. And for the Dutch, the North Sea would be at the top. That would be at the top if you were doing a landscape, for example. Let's look at that map closer. And you can see all the ships and the seas on which they sail. The names are given there. And here's the original map. You can see it's very accurate. In fact, the only map that we know of that exists, and this is the case with most of the painting, the maps in Vermeer's paintings, maybe only one, two or three, but not more original survive. There's only one that survives today that was put together. It's in a museum in North Holland in Horn. Now let's look at the map close up because this is made up of many different sheets. The central part is from engraved copper plates, 22 engraved plates. And then this map includes text on three sides, Dutch, French, and Latin, and that's uh, printed um, on paper as well. So <clears throat> these um, different sheets of paper would be mounted to a canvas, glued on, and then uh, hand-colored, and then varnished, and often put on rollers. And the reason for rollers, you could roll them up, but also the rollers would um, keep it away from the wall so humidity in that would not be so much a factor. Well, Vermeer used this map another time in this painting. The map looks entirely different. In fact, you may not think it's the same map, but trust me, it is. <laughs> and one of the reasons it looks somewhat different is it's a, only about half of the map is showing. But he's orchestrated it in such a way that it's now reduced to ochre tones that complements his blue and yellow scheme that is so popular in many of his paintings just like this rectilinear design is so <clears throat> such a favorite of Vermeer. It's this map that he used a third time. Actually, it's on a stained wall. You can see the stains coming down. <clears throat> and here you have a woman not reading a letter, but about to, receiving a letter under uh, a landscape and a seascape. Now, one questions, did Vermeer own this map? Because if you think about it, it's in one of his earliest works, about 1657. It's in this painting from mid-career, and this one toward the end of his career. Well, in fact, we don't know if he owned it or if he borrowed it. If there is an inventory done of Vermeer's estate when he died in 1675. It doesn't mention any maps, no cartographic material. But it does mention a lot of paintings by other artists as well, because he, was, he ran an art shop. Another map of the Netherlands, that, and this is the first one that I was able to discover, this is a painting in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Well, it is a real map, and here it is, and it's the Netherlands, it's the north and the south. This is um, showing north to the right, and of course, the Netherlands is a very interesting country at this time, because the southern Netherlands, by the end of the 16th century, um, remained loyal to Spain, Catholic, whereas the north, through the 80 Years' War, broke away and became Protestant and became the new Dutch Republic, the seven provinces versus the 10 provinces from the south. Now here's where we get to see, and you can see how specific it is. You can identify the map mainly by the cartouches. But if you look closely, you have what we call in art history some pentimenti, the singular is pentimento. It comes from the Italian word pentire, which means to repent or change your mind. It's basically when an artist covers up an original, an earlier design because he wants to improve the painting. Art historians love discovering pentimenti because it usually means, not absolutely sure, but usually means you're not looking at a copy, but you're looking at the original. Well, what happens is that those underdesigns, because paint becomes more transparent over the years, sometimes those underdesigns come through and you can see them. 
without using x-ray or infrared photography. And there are a couple pentimenti in this painting. You can see the map was originally behind the woman's head, and there was a chair in the foreground. Vermeer used uh, other subjects besides the Netherlands. I think this is very obvious to you. It's the, a map of Europe. It's a great wall map. It was um, first published by Jodocus Hondius in 1613, and then Johan Blau took it over, reissued the map again, and the only thing he did was change his name. And, of course, the date is now 1659. Vermeer's painting is very detailed, but even in Vermeer's painting, we can't see the name of the author here. Otherwise, we could say which edition it is. <clears throat> and this is one of the remaining examples. You can see it's not in great condition. There were three great atlases were put together in the 17th century as political gifts. And one went to uh, the King of England. Uh, and they were made up of wall maps. So it's a huge book. Well, the most ambitious map uh, that appears in Vermeer's painting happily appears in his most ambitious composition and a, a work that's been written about a lot. This map had been identified before I started working on it, and it was identified um, the central part only. It's a map of the Netherlands. I think you're getting to know the country with north to the top, uh, north to the right, west at the top. It's made into a very elaborate wall map with all this decoration on the side. And we do know that there were catalogs at this time saying that you can get a map made up in any way you want. Vermeer was not the only Dutch painter to feature this map in his paintings. It appears in three paintings um, by Jakob Achterveld. It's a framed map. It's made up of uh, nine sheets printed from a copper plate, 1594. Now, Klaus Jans und Fischer takes over those copper plates and produces a map, we think about 1630. And the interesting thing is that the only difference between the sheet on the left and the one on the right is the cartouche. No changes in the topography. So it is so wonderful that in Vermeer's most complex and one of his largest paintings that he preserved for us this great map from the 17th century. Well, this map might have been featured in another painting, we think, and that is this painting. You don't see it today, but it probably was in there originally. And x-rays show, as we can see on the left here, there was a map behind that woman. And even in spite of all the detail that went into it, he painted it out. Again, the maps tell us a lot about his editing. You can see he not only got rid of the map, but he also got rid of the musical instrument on the chair. This is the beauty of Vermeer. Editing, editing, reduction, reduction. You, that's where you get to the beauty. One might wonder about the maps in his paintings. Are they more than just decoration? Um, we do know that many art historians have talked about, not just Vermeer, but documented that many of the background objects are symbolic in these paintings. Well, first of all, what is this painting all about? It's not a portrait of Vermeer in a studio. It's an allegorical painting, somewhat suggested by the, the drapery pulled back. He's revealing, actually, something from the past. And the, the costume that the painter is wearing is Burgundian. It's from the 16th century. But he's just cobbled together here a costume which for him is from the earlier days. The woman in front of the map is no ordinary woman. She's an allegorical figure. She is Cleo, the muse of history. And that's why she's holding a trumpet and holding the book of Thucydides, the father of history. And a nice little detail here is that she's wearing a crown of laurel leaves. Why laurel? Because laurel always remains green, right? People who are, should be famous should be famous forever. But the irony of it here is that the, blue, the leaves are now blue. It's a good example of that blue sickness where they were originally green, but the yellow has disappeared. What about the map in the painting? Is it symbolic? Most art historians have interpreted the painting as this is the artist looking at history, and it's through history that we are able to capture the ideal. It's when you step back, you see what's really important in history, right? In any case, this is the concept behind this painting. Well, the map is perfect, because the map is a map of the 17 provinces, <clears throat> which gradually divided during the late 16th and 17th century. It was one of the bloodiest wars in the history of mankind, the Eighty Years' War. Um, already by the early 17th century, the Dutch were considered independent from Spain, but it really wasn't concluded until 1648 with the Treaty of Münster. 
that there's a crack in that map, as you can see, and it happens to go right down the middle of that map, going right through the town of Breda, which is one of the strategic cities during the 80 Years' War, separating the north from the south. Well, there's one map, or one painting, in Vermeer's <coughs> um, paintings that we know was used allegorically. And this is an, an allegory somewhat similar to the one you've just looked at with the curtain separating it from us. It's called The Allegory of Faith. It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Uh, and Vermeer here, who was Catholic at this time, basically followed a recipe book. And these books that painters use would tell you how to depict an allegorical figure. And in this book by Cesare Ripa, it says if you're going to depict the figure of faith, she should have her foot on the earth. Well, for Vermeer, it would be none other than a ter real terrestrial globe, right? Also, Vermeer puts the foot of faith on Asia, which at that time was considered outside the Christian world. If the globe is maybe is, is symbolic, what about the other maps? Let's think about this one. You've got a, a map on the back wall, of this couple um, enjoying each other in this light-filled room. We know that that map appeared in two other paintings, one reading a letter, receiving a letter. Um, what about these maps? One woman looking out the window, another woman looking out the window with another a watering pitcher, but also a musical instrument. They may relate to a very common theme in Dutch art, one that dates back to the Middle Ages, um, very popular among D uh, Dutch and German artists, called Frau Welt, or Lady World. Does the map on the back wall represent worldliness here? And there's all these elements of worldliness. What about this painting? The map was painted out, but it is clearly a vanitas picture. Um, the woman is looking into a mirror, holding a pearl earring or a pearl necklace. It's all about this theme, but Vermeer has edited down so much that we have to know that. But in the 17th century, they would know that this is a picture of vanitas. Well, we do know that Vermeer must have had the opportunity to observe map makers making these maps. In fact, um, this painting, which is in Frankfurt, uh, is a beautiful illustration of a, a man surrounded by cartographic material in his study, uh, in his workshop, probably the same room that was used for those other works. In this case, he's staging these people and objects and props. But what's important is the man is looking out the window and capturing that world on paper, bringing the world home. And if you look on the back wall, you'll see there's a framed map. Uh, it is a postcard, as they're called. These are often printed on parchment. And the reason, I think, is that they were often taken to sea because they were designed to be used at sea. You can see, again, west is um, at the top. And the only thing that's really recorded on this map are all the coastal towns and then all those rum lines that enabled people to navigate, the, navigate themselves around the, the Atlantic and the uh, Baltic and the Mediterranean world. You'll notice on the back wall, there's a terrestrial globe. No surprise, it's the same terrestrial globe that we saw in the Allegory of Faith. It's now in a, a stand, treated like a scientific instrument. And interesting enough, uh, you have the um, East Indies facing us. Very important to the Dutch with their East Indies companies. Well, another painting by Vermeer that we're quite sure were pendants uh, when they were painted. There have been efforts to identify the man. Some people say Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. It could be just a neighbor of Vermeer. We don't know. Here we see it close up. <clears throat> and here you can see the globe, this hondiest globe in the same position. You can make out the constellations there. And if you look, you can see that the globe uh, is surrounded by other instruments, uh, such as the uh, astrolabe at the foot of it. And then there's a compass on the table. What's significant <clears throat> about all this is that so much of the cartographic material is out of date when Vermeer's using it. For example, the Globe, 1618, the, um, the Blau van Birkenrode map, 1621, the book, uh, about 1621, or 1620 exactly, and these appear in these paintings 40 years later. So one wonders, is Vermeer, and he is toward the end of the Golden Age, and it does come to an end, like all Golden Ages, the French become very powerful. Is he reflecting back on this incredible time in Holland about the great age of map making, the great age of everything almost in this new Dutch Republic? But the beauty is he's painting the everyday world. And that's significant because genre painting, scenes of everyday life, were the, one of the greatest contributions of the, the Dutch at this time. Well, what about <clears throat> these two paintings? Are they allegories? Well, they could well be. They were bought and sold together up until the 18th century. And um, just like the paintings, the globes 
exhibit a pendant relationship. Terrestrial and celestial globes were published together, and they were expensive. A pair of globes like this, that size, would cost about 32 guilders. That would be about the, a month's salary of a cloth worker in Delft at that time. All of Vermeer's paintings in which he uses maps, but certainly in these, um, is captured not only in his paintings, but carries over into our own time. So specifically, he captures the wonder and excitement of using cartographic material at this time. This kind of excitement for capturing the world, both in time and spirit, coincides with Vermeer's fascination with specific maps and globes, which certainly has left us one of the richest records of Holland's golden age of Dutch mapmaking.